gotten, so I want to make sure we get started. <laughs> so, to start off, welcome everyone. If anyone is, can hear me, um, please confirm if you can hear me, okay? Or if you can hear Dave as well, please confirm if you can hear us talking. Okay, do it through either the Q&A or through the chat, just want to make sure, okay? Bill's confirmed that he can hear us. Cool. Okay. Good. So I'm getting confirmation so we can we can start. I always like to make sure. So welcome everyone to our first Talking with a Pro webinar. Our special guest today is David Yates of Trickfish Amplification. Um, and Dave, I thought it would be a good thing to start just with an introduction, you know, give us a little bit of your background. In the meantime, I'm going to be sharing my screen. So Dave, confirm if you can see it. Also, you guys online, confirm if you can see my screen, okay? Sounds good. I don't, not seeing the screen quite yet. Uh-oh. We, we lost Internet. Oh, it's not good. Oh, no. Music. Perfect time to lose Internet. Right. Yeah, so right now, it's still recording, so it's going to be recording nothing for now. Um, you you can hear me, Dave, right? So I think Yeah, I can hear you, else. but what about the other participants? Are they out right now? Oh, they good. Should okay. Probably hear us. They should probably hear us because you're you're on the we're on the phone. Um, but I can't share my screen with you guys right now. Can you hear me, Carolina? Yeah, it looks like we've got to confirm that uh, that the folks can hear us. So okay. I'll go ahead and, and do a little introduction and talk a little bit while you're uh, working on your end, George. All right, go for it, Dave. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Well, my name's David Yates. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Um, I, in my day job, I'm a medical device guy. I, I can assure you I'm not uh, speaking on behalf of that company right now, but I'm um, speaking on behalf of Trickfish and uh, the what we call Low Freak, one of our businesses um, that uh, does a lot of design for uh, the bass guitar market, the pro audio, is specifically bass guitar. Um, my partner, uh, business partner, Mike Pope, and I uh, have been uh, working on uh, a lot of different kinds of things together over the last um, I think about 12 years now, and uh, a couple of our big products have been um, the uh, the Federa preamps, the, the preamplifiers that go in the Federa bases. Um, I'll share some pictures of that. Um, oh, looks like the internet's starting to come up here, um, or I'm the host now. Um, yeah, you might be the host now. Yeah, I'm the host. <laughs> George trusts me apparently. So uh, uh, yeah, we'll work on that. Actually, I'm going to just click share screen and. Um, see if can you folks see my screen now, mm -hmm. David? If you can, double check if it's still recording, because I'm on my end it can't record anymore. So double check if yours is recording. The red dot be able looks to... like there's a red dot there. It looks like it's recording. Um, okay, you see the, the time elapsing? You see the time elapsing there on that little red dot? Um, let's see. Um, I can't Usually really you can tell. tell from the event. Okay. Um, if if the red, it, it'll usually tell you at the top if you're still recording. Like if you move your mouse cursor towards the top of the screen, you'll be able to see if it's still recording or not. There is a little red light where it's there, and there's a, a button for recorder. If I hit that, um, mm -hmm. oh, it says recording. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. Good. All right. Keep, keep rolling with it. Okay. Well, I keep fighting with this over here. Now I'm sharing my screen. I can't seem to see the other stuff there, but okay. Well, I'll go ahead and keep talking. I presume you guys can can see that, okay? Um, so at any rate, um, the Federa bases. We do a lot of that. We sell a product called the FlexCore, which is a preamplifier that Mike and I designed. That uh, it has uh, uh, lots of flexibility, lots of configurability. Um, pretty much will fit in most anybody's base uh, with no soldering if they like. They, we've got screw terminals and and all that kind of stuff to make it a lot easier. Most musicians aren't particularly good at um, at soldering or <laughs> whatever else. I like to call it guitar soldering. It's a kind of a special uh, technique. <laughs> Involves a blowtorch or something. But at any rate, we've um, done that. And then uh, most recently, Mike and I partnered up with uh, with Richard Ruse and 
Anthony Fergioso to do some uh, work on a company we call Trickfish, and that's a big power amplifier uh, for bases and so forth. Um, let's see, I'm going to pull up a couple of pictures while I'm sharing my screen. Um, hopefully you can see that. That's a, that's a picture of the, the Trickfish amplifier, nice beauty shot. Um, some people enjoying playing it at the NAMM show. This guy right here uh, in the middle is Mike Pope, my design partner, along with some other uh, rather famous bass players. Um, some other folks here, um, logos and so forth. Um, that's uh, I think that's a pretty good introduction of what I'm doing there. I'm playing my bass, one of my basses. Um, are these pictures coming through okay? George, can you see them? Yeah, I can see them. You're on there? I'm okay, good. In. I'm back in. So you're still the host, so it's fine. You keep rolling with it. <laughs> okay. I wonder if there's a way I can pass that host off to you. Um, I can always grab it back, so don't worry. I can grab it back once you're ready to let me have it. You let me okay. know, and I'll grab it back. Uh, just a couple more pictures here. There's one, another one of my bases. Um, oh, that's my Land Cruiser. i crawl up a thing here. Here's a, here's a beauty shot from Federa. Uh, this is the internals of uh, uh, one of our preamplifiers that goes in the Federa base. This is our, our custom shot preamplifier. Uh, we've got all kinds of really neat stuff in there where uh, you can configure things with jumpers. We've got uh, analog switches that will move centers of uh, frequency controls up and down based on uh, what other controls are doing and uh, all kinds of uh, sophistication and flexibility in that. Um, and uh, there's a little picture of the layout that we'll be talking about in a couple of minutes. Here's, I just threw in a couple of pictures. This is a Saturday Night Live band. Uh, the guy, James Genus, this guy right here in the middle, uh, he's been a Federa player for years. So if you listen to Saturday Night Live or watch Saturday Night Live, you've You've heard my base work. Um, well, not my base work, <laughs> my preamplifier work. Oh, there's my main cruiser again. Um, there's a picture of the uh, retail packaging for the Flex Core box. Uh, the Roots guy also, he, he plays uh, a Federa base that has my electronics in it as well. Um, so anyway, that's, that's it on my pictures. I'm going to go ahead and um, see if I can send this back to you, George. If not, I can uh, grab it. No worries. If you've got a hold of that. Yeah, I'll grab it. I got it. Great. Okay. So good news is the recording survived all of this, <laughs> which is good. Um, basically, as soon as I dropped off, you became the presenter. It's something that the system does to protect, basically make sure everything is working. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen with you guys now because I have the, the schematic of this. That, that's what we're going to be discussing. Okay, so hopefully nothing like that happens again because that, that'll be scary. Um, so this is basically the, the circuit Dave and I are going to be discussing. This is one of his headphone amplifiers. Um, it's actually a segment of a much larger design, right, right, David? That's right. This is actually a segment from the design of the uh, what we call the MPP-1 and MPP-2 Michael Pope preamplifier. Um, this is Mike's design. I had a lot of work, uh, a lot of help uh, with him on that to get that together. But this headphone section is really interesting, and I thought this would be good because it covers a lot of uh, a lot of analog territory and a lot of places you can get yourself in trouble with what looks to be a fairly simple, straightforward uh, circuit design. Excellent. Cool. So um, this is the redrawn schematic in Eagle. Word to the wise on everyone listening: the original design was not done in Eagle, so the schematic's been redrawn. Um, but the layout will be going off a picture of the layout when we when we start discussing that section. Okay. So in, in this basic section, I can see it's it's symmetrical. You have a left and a right channel, as as I've indicated here. Yes. Um, the basic input stage, and then we have these two two op amps here. These are OPAs 2134s. I did bring up the data sheets of them. If we want to discuss any aspect of that. Um, Kind of a question I, I have for you, and maybe some of the some of the users listening. If you guys have any questions at any point, please feel free to send them into the chat or through the Q and A. We do see them, so if it's something we can respond in this moment, you know, we'll, we'll handle it then. Or if not at the end, you can guys can send any additional questions. Um, this yeah, great question. For that, might be why in the world did we use such an expensive op amp for a buffer? 
And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we probably had two channels left over. Um, that's more op amp than we actually need for this particular section. So we probably actually had a, uh, I don't know if that's a 2134, 4134. Uh, 4134 is a quad version of that. And that's probably what, uh, that's probably what happened in reality. Okay. If, if let's say someone didn't want to use the 2134, in, in this case the OPA, what would be something suitable that's maybe a little bit cheaper and you can would maybe still be equivalent for this application? Sure. Well, this has a, a relatively straightforward function. It's just a, a, a I can't I can't remember if there's a tiny there's a tiny little bit of gain there. I think. Um, yeah, there is a bit of gain there uh, to get that up. So really, uh, you could use all kinds of op amps there as long as it had uh, adequate bandwidth and uh, didn't have any real noise problems. Um, typically, people don't um, treat the headphone drivers with a whole lot of care and they're noisy and, and clunky and whatever else. This headphone driver is an amazing part from TI, really good part. And so uh, maybe part of the reason why we had such a good buffer is we want to make sure we weren't uh, adding any noise. This, um, this particular headphone driver is quieter than a compact disc, so we wanted to make sure we had a really good signal going into it. Um, Excellent. So, so with the filter on, on, the, on the buffer, you're also kind of limiting the bandwidth of the circuit, right? Right, just a little bit of roll off because there's no need to pass anything above about 30 kilohertz in there, um, and that's, uh, that's actually a pretty high frequency roll off. Um, so um, it's just to kind of tame things a little bit. Um, the balance control that you see on the left-hand side of the schematic, that's actually a ganged pot, and it's one of those weird uh, balance tapers where when the pot is in the middle position, uh, you've got zero ohms and full scale on uh, one side and full scale and zero ohms on the other. So that basically you, you can turn it all the way left or all the way right. And um, I think we were limited. We had a, we had a 10K pot we were using there, and um, we want to make sure that the that the input to the op amp, I prefer an inverting input if I possibly can because it, it controls the, um, the roll off the high frequency. And so we've got a 100K ohm source resistance, or sorry, um, load for the pot, uh, or basically 200K load for the pot. Um, so you've got 200K to ground and then, then 500K on the other side. So it's going to be you know something under 200K, 175K or something like that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Let me, so, as far as that, because gang pots are, are, you know, number one are expensive, and number two, their tracking is sometimes, you know, iffy. Yes. They, they don't always aren't perfectly symmetrical when, when they transition. Um, is there any other way this could be done? Any other way? Maybe you would have preferred to have done it instead of the, the dual gang pot. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the design considerations were to have a balance control on the headphone jack or headphone output because um, uh, typically people are playing along with music or something like that. I think we actually, uh, we had two channels of input or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, looks like there's a question up here too. I'm, I'm missing it. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, question about Johnson noise. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I used the 500K instead of a 50K or a 10K or something like that was because I had to deal with the, um, with the, uh, not loading that 10K pot. I didn't want a significant load on that pot. You're absolutely correct. That 500K ohm resistor in that circuit uh, will, will definitely give you more voltage noise. Um, but that's actually, I want to talk about voltage noise and current noise in a little bit. So that's a great question. Okay, so everyone can see the screen. Uh, I feel like someone complained that they can't see it. Uh, let me make sure before we continue. Confirm if you guys can see it to the chat or to the Q&A. Okay. We get some confirmation. I think I think it's going all to you right now. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, they can see it. It's cool. Everyone's okay, good. It. All right. Good. Okay. All right, so we can we can keep going. Um, as far as 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 these drivers um, that you had mentioned, this TI part. You mentioned that even though they look like an op amp here in the schematic, they actually do require quite a bit of drive current into them. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, sure. Um, as a matter of fact, let me grab the screen and I'll pop open um, 
uh, some notes I have on that um, on that headphone driver. Sure. Um, me, I'll here. pass it to you now, okay? Okay. You're going to be the presenter now. Okay. So I've got I copied some stuff out of uh, the TI data sheet, and um, I'm hoping you guys can see that okay. I can't yet. I saw, did you share your screen? I think I did. Uh, oh, here okay, we go. Here we go. Well, thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I got you. There we go. Got you. Okay, so let's see if I can pull it up. Okay. Can you see the this uh, headphone driver app note okay? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Okay. So, um, basically, this is this TPA 6120A2 driver over here is the is the main circuit. Uh, that's the headphone driver circuit. And um, they show this as, a, you know, coming out of an audio DAC and going into some sort of a buffer here. But you can see that they really want you to have uh, these, these um, quasi-balanced inputs or this balanced input uh, coming from this balanced output of this thing. Uh, you don't have to do it balanced, which is, in fact, the way we did it. But um, but they've got uh, they've got these 1K ohm resistors in series. And there's some really funny things about this. This is a current feedback amplifier. And so you have to be careful about the size of this resistor. Um, uh, lower level is 800 ohms that they recommend here. And uh, the upper level, I think, was 2K. Um, and if you put any capacitors across these feedback resistors, like a lot of people would want to do to control um, feedback, or sorry, control uh, the stability of the amplifier, um, they actually will short at the high frequencies and cause this amplifier to go really wonky. So um, there's some things that we had to do in the layout to take care of that as well that we'll talk about here in just a minute. But this thing wanted a lot of input current, relatively speaking, from, from this thing. So you couldn't actually just come right out of the audio deck and cram it into the, into the headphone driver you had to go through a buffer stage, which um, which makes it a little bit more expensive. Um, and they actually they use 4134s here, but that's a that's a TI thing. They're going to call out their own parts, of course. Um, but um, at any rate, this headphone driver is great. It will really really drive hard, and you can see that the the, um, uh, the dynamic range they claim is greater than 100 dB for the entire system if you use these components. Um, let me just um, let me just pop over to the layout for a second. Let me find that picture. Um, take me just a second here, zipping through speaker cabinets and all kinds of me playing bass again. <laughs> uh, there it is. Okay. I'm going to blow this up a little bit um, and move this over here. So the reference designators aren't going to be exactly the same as a schematic, but this layout here, this U10 is the headphone driver. And the thing gets really hot, so we had to take care of some things there. But uh, the data sheet was really explicit about ground planes underneath the pads because of any residual capacitance that you might have uh, could cause the thing to go unstable or have other problems. Um, so you can see that we've got ground plane in the green uh, all over the place. And we've got split planes, and we're careful about what gets attached to what, so forth. Um, you can have ground plane under the chip, but you couldn't have ground plane uh, near where the pins go in the chip or uh, or underneath any of this other stuff. So these resistors, for example, it's R84. Uh, that's probably one of those uh, input resistors, one of those uh, 2K input resistors in our design. And, of course, the bypass caps are sitting right next to it as close as they possibly can. Um, and big fat traces for power and ground and plus and minus power and so forth. Um, the other thing that we did was we, uh, we soldered the chip down to this, um, to this little pad that was underneath it here, and then we stitched a whole bunch of holes through that to try to attach to the other side on the heat sink. You know, to use this, this um, section of, of copper as heat sink. And it worked. It was enough, uh, but it was pretty warm over there. And so that's, um, uh, that's something to worry about as well. That's something to con uh, consider if you're going through this stuff. Um, let me see if I can figure out, are there any questions or has there any, anything pop up? Um, so far, nothing else on on the other than the one you got on Johnson noise. But I know you're going to touch on it. One thing to to, to talk about in, in this particular part, the data sheet rates it at one and a half watts, which for a surface mount component is actually quite a bit of power to have to dissipate. Yes, it um, is. As, as as you mentioned, it is a current feedback amplifier, 
but it's also an A B stage. So its efficiency is always less than seventy five percent. I mean in an ideal theoretical case it's in that neighborhood of sixty five to seventy. Um but in practical terms it usually drops more than that, if I recall. Right. So the quiescent heat out of this thing, quiescent power consumption is relatively high. Um, that's always something you have to be considering when you're uh, dealing with power supplies and power traces, but the, and it's the heat itself. Uh, if you plop this thing down to something that's particularly heat sensitive, let's say, for example, you were building a, uh, an analog synthesizer and you had an oscillator that, uh, that where the stuff had to stay uh, at relatively at the same temperature, uh, or at an elevated temperature or whatever else, this thing could really throw, throw you for a loop uh, because it does run really warm. And did you burn any in development? <laughs> I burnt my thumb a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, this uh, TI's got a great development kit for that, too, or development evaluation board um, where everything's all comes all soldered down, and it's a great headphone driver. It's really nice to just buy it, put it in a box, and call it a headphone amplifier. Use it at your desk at work. Uh, I did that for a while, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty sweet. In the case of the of the schematic, you know, we basically just separated it at at the uh, the headphone amplifier part. But what you know, were the balance left side and the balance right channel? Um, what could be feeding those? Like in the case, for example. Let's say we had a base. A base is a mono output. How would you, how would you, let's say, interface that to this type of circuit? Sure. Just use one of the channels and, and call it a day, or would you try to go to both channels? What's usually, what's preferred? The base is going to both channels simultaneously and at the same level. So essentially, what we did was we took two inputs, a left and a right input, uh, that could come from either uh, stage monitoring or. Uh, your CD player, if you want to do practice, uh, you know, whatever else, practice through the preamplifier. And we just basically sum the audio from the external with the bass signal in a, uh, just a summing amplifier. So that we had um, the mono bass coming in left and right, and then we had left and right channels coming in from the connectors on the back of the preamplifier. Got it. Actually, we did something very similar to that in the Trickfish, uh, except instead of just going into the headphones, uh, it will go uh, out the speaker as well. So you can plug your, your iPad or iPhone or whatever you got uh, into thing and, and into the amplifier, and it'll play out your bass speaker so you can, you can say to the band, hey, this is, uh, this is what I'm talking about, this song right here, this passage. And it's really handy. Nice. It also can be very loud. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. The bullhead, I think, is 1,000 watts, right? Right. It's 1,000 watts of, of uh, peak power. and. Um, oh. It gets pretty serious. Yeah, that'll hurt some people. <laughs> okay, there's, so far there aren't any other questions uh, on on this part. If if you wanted to go on to the noise thing, sure. Feel free. So let me um, let's talk about that for a minute. So um, interestingly, you know, you you. Um, if you actually read through some of these data sheets, TI's got some pretty good sections in here. So this is the um, this is the OPA 1641-4244 series op amps. Really nice, high quality audio op amp. Uh, I like using this one. This is a relatively new part. Um, it has some other performance things along with uh, uh, that are that are complementary to the 4134 series. We can talk about that in a moment. Um, there's some great sections in these data sheets on how to calculate the noise. So if you actually actually go through this, uh, you can see um, here's the basic noise calculations. I invite people to take a look at this uh, after the webinar if they're interested in, in looking at some of the stuff. But, but it's, the map is not that scary. Um, you actually grab a hold of the thermal noise of your resistors. There was a question on the Johnson noise earlier. Uh, and then the, uh, the performance of the op amp itself that's specified. Um, there's a question here. Let me see if I can pop that question open. Um, we won't be able to see it, just so you know. You, you okay. see it because you're the presenter right now, but we won't be able to see the question itself. So it's good usually to repeat it. Okay. If, if it's something you think that's valuable for everyone, or sure, I'll uh, I'll go through that these questions here in just a second. I, I popped that open. I can see what they are. Um, okay, great. 
So again, looking at this picture uh, that shows how to calculate the noise for non-inverting or inverting uh, configurations for the um, for these uh, amplifiers, and um, so you look at that as like, well, all right. And there's also stuff on uh, distortion measurements and so forth that you can where you can estimate how the thing will distort. So I said, all right, let's just take all this stuff and I'll, I'll put this up here. It's going to be a little uh, eye blast here for a second. Uh, but here's a spreadsheet that I used to calculate the overall uh, system noise for the TrickFish amplifier. Um, there's, uh, we, we, I looked at different op amps and what they might do. I, I put their uh, voltage noise, current noise specifications in, uh, different sections of, uh, of the uh, circuit where we have uh, uh, you know, different stages and so forth that I'd calculate the relative noise. And that would let me then um, be able to uh, pick the right part for the right section because um, some sections, if you use a, a op amp that's optimized for current noise, uh, but not optimized for voltage noise, you can get yourself in a little bit of noise trouble. So just throwing an expensive op amp at the problem doesn't always solve it. Um, sometimes it'll get you there, <laughs> but, uh, but other times you want to try to pick and choose which has the best performance for what. So, for example, a section where I need a lot of gain, uh, that's what I really want to pay attention to the voltage noise or current noise and those resistor values and so forth. Um, so let me address a couple of these questions here. Uh, there's one from, uh, from Doug Beeson that says, do, you, do I use LDOs or switch mode power supplies? Well, it depends on the situation. Um, in the Mike Pope preamplifier, we actually had a, a linear power supply uh, with a toroidal transformer, and it was double regulated. So we actually had two sets of voltage regulators on it where we had a higher voltage section and a lower voltage section. And that power supply was just as clean as it could possibly be. And it was really super quiet that way. Um, most of the modern switch mode amplifiers, uh, the, the class D amplifiers that you find base amplifiers, they produce power supply sections, which, which are switching power supplies. And so at that point, you've got to uh, be careful that you're, um, that you're treating those switch mode power supplies properly, that you've got the right filtering on it, that you've got the right bypass, that you've got the right wire routing and so forth. And you can actually get a lot of great performance out of switch mode power supplies and audio. That used to be like, you know, the, the lowest of the low, in my opinion. Anytime there's a switch mode power supply and audio, I was like, oh, man, that, they must not know what they're doing. And I finally came around and said, oh, well, gosh, if you just pay attention to a couple of things, uh, you can actually get some pretty good performance. The best, of course, would be to have a linear power supply. And I actually designed an audio preamplifier one time that ran off of batteries. And um, I'll say it sounded great. <laughs> I can't say that it was that that, uh, uh, that made it the best thing anybody's ever heard, but it did sound pretty good that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, somebody else, Doug likes batteries as well. Uh, they're great until you have to charge them. Um, there's another question that's probably more related to uh, the use of Eagle and so forth that's, um, you know, how, can, how do I describe proof of concept development techniques? Uh, can't necessarily afford to have a PCB cut for every little idea. Um, so I, I do build a lot of things by hand. I will, a lot of simple circuits I've got. Um, if I'm doing strictly proof of concept, I'll use one of those um, global specialties boards that, uh, where you can plug through hole parts in. Uh, I've got a bunch of surfboard things where I can solder um, um, surface mount parts on and then plug them into a through hole, uh, wire them up that way just to make sure things are working like I expect. But I don't ever expect my hand wired prototypes to, uh, to work like a PCB once it's been designed and, and more or less optimized. But um, if I'm doing something on my own, I'm trying to save some money, uh, I might spend, you know, I might spend a couple hundred dollars on having a circuit board made. Uh, find an inexpensive house to do that for me. Um, but uh, if it's for, for production, I probably uh, try to tell the person I'm working for to expect three turns on the board, and it's usually two. But if you tell them three and then you give them two, they're happy. But if you tell them one and you give, give them three and then try to charge them for it, they don't like that so much. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Doug, but. Um, well, well, to add a little bit to, to Doug's question, um, nowadays, it's a, it is actually possible to get a board spun for every little idea you get. Um, now, with, with the popularity of gang-run board houses, it actually becomes very economically feasible to, to make a board, even if it's for, for a one-off. Um, to give you an example, 
One place we tend to recommend a lot is uh, Osh Park, OSH Park. They charge you five dollars a square inch, and you get three boards for that. So if you have a you know a two by two board, that's four square inches times five gives you twenty dollars, and you get three boards. You know. So yeah, that's a so great that's, bargain. Twenty bucks compared to you know several hours of of uh, soldering and making mistakes and you know whatever else. Um, bug wiring everywhere that's that's pretty cool yeah so it's it's good to do a little bit of research another one that you know keep in mind that there is there's a, like a week and a half turnaround on that so it's not as fast as sitting down and doing it but if you want to have a pcb for it just to you know clean it up it really is something that's very feasible to do nowadays where you can just you know if, especially if it's a small board you know using a service like osh park which is domestic they are in the u.s um, makes a lot of sense for for a one week turnaround. You get two layer board. If if you go for a four layer board, I think it's something like ten dollars a square inch. Or yeah, something like that, ten dollars a square inch. But again, still still a pretty good bargain, especially if it's a small board. So something to keep in mind. Okay, any Very other cool. questions that they put your your way, Dave? I'm sorry. Say again. Have they sent any other questions your way? Oh, I don't uh, think I got something. Oh, let's see. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess Doug's in Canada. He, he definitely used the OSH Park. Oh, okay, cool. Nice. Given all the manufacturing that's up in Canada, I would expect you might be able to find some someplace up there that would do that as well. Um, let me kind of go a little bit backwards here. I'm gonna I'm gonna pop up this thing I call my design checklist. So uh, a lot of times what I'll try to do if I'm if I'm building a project, I'm starting from scratch or something, I'll try to think of, of some things that um, that can get in the way. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of, of things that you might check for, but um, I just wanted to put this out there uh, and and folks chime in if you think of other things or uh, you know whatever else there's there's always something that will that uh, is different or unique about a project, it seems. But just having the component layout architecture set, a lot of times I'll I'll take parts and I'll lay them on a, uh, a piece of graph paper and just try to make sure I can physically uh, get them there. Or if I'm you know, if I'm doing something by hand, or um, certainly having a, a tool like Eagle is a huge help because you can um, you can uh, lay things out real nice. And let me say something about that as well. I found that um, that when we're talking to our uh, folks that are helping us with enclosures or speaker cabinets or crossover networks or, uh, you know, whatever else. There are a lot of people out there using Eagle, and it's really super helpful when you can share files and you can you can uh, uh, have them put that into their mechanical system and um, and just uh, uh, interact that way. It really really makes things a lot easier when people are using the, the same software and to have the, the ability to do the 3D section of it where you can actually do the the mechanical layout, that's huge. It makes a big difference and it, it saves a lot of time um, because, you know, people think about electronics as being all about circuits and theory and math and stuff like that a lot of times. But no, I mean, it's it's got to be about about 60 to 70 percent of, of electromechanical is trying to figure out how to physically put it in a place, how to connect to it, how to wire to it, how to make it reliable. The reliability uh, a lot of times reliability has to do with the enclosure and, and the mechanics around it. Um, these parts don't fail on their own unless you do something silly with them with heat or over voltage or over current or something, but they're very reliable until you put them in a mechanical system uh, that's not been well thought out. Anyway, so more physical things, just like power. Where, how are you going to power a thing? Batteries, wall wart, you know, are you going to do energy harvesting? <laughs> you know, how are you going to power it? Uh, how to get the heat out? EMC. Maybe not so much on a DIY project, uh, but then again, maybe so. Uh, you don't want to be interfering with your stuff next door. You don't want uh, your cell phone making your, your uh, guitar effect pedals start making funny noises and so forth. Um, ESD is another one. That, this, is, this is a really tricky thing. Um, I've uh, been gravitating towards using parts that are ESD tolerant more so than others. For example, let's see if I can pull up the, this... Um, 1642 actually has, pull up here to the top, actually has a um, um, an ESD rating. Where is it? Maybe I passed it already. Oh, there it is. So 
they actually test this against the human body model for this, uh, this particular ANSI test, uh, 3,000 volts. And a lot of times um, parts either don't have a rating here at all or they can't make it quite this high. And that seems to help along with other, uh, other mitigation for, for uh, static. Um, I'll call it my document here again. I'm losing my spot. There we go. Um, anyway, there are all kinds of other things you can do. Uh, ESD protection diode snubbers. Um, I put shark's teeth in here. I'm not sure why. I don't think those actually work. But there's, uh, there are all kinds of things people will do for ESD. Um, sometimes just really good layout of wiring on the inside of your component or inside of your box will help with ESD. Um, at any rate, <clears throat> power supply, you know, um, power supply rejection ratio is one of my favorite things. If you look at some op-amp data sheets, you actually look at the power supply rejection ratio if they specify it. Sometimes it actually will uh, take ripple from the power supply at high frequency and it will actually amplify it. So you have to be careful with that. Um, what's your bypass strategy? How are you going to how are you going to put bypass caps in there, or how are you going to essentially make that power supply? Um, uh, rugged and, and, and stiff and rigid to be able to drive your parts as, as you've got um, headphone amplifiers you're driving, for example, or you don't want to, you know, start playing loud out the headphone driver and all of a sudden have your voltage sag. That's, that's really not cool. Um, and especially if it's sagging along with the music, then all of a sudden you get all kinds of weird uh, distortion components that come on the output. It could be really strange. Um, Got to make sure that you've got the the trace length and width optimized for the power supply, that's a big deal. Grounding is another one. Man, there's just all kinds of places to get in trouble with grounding. Um, back, I remember back in the days when I worked for GE Medical Systems, we had a 12-bit uh, A to D converter, which was kind of a big deal back in the, back in the early and middle 80s. And um, that we had all kinds of trouble because we couldn't figure out how to actually connect the, the grounds properly on it because uh, our system ground was one, had one set of requirements. The uh, compliance for safety had another set of requirements. And this A to D converter thought it was the center of the universe and it wanted us to, to connect ground right at that chip. And like, oh, wait a minute, this is a giant X-ray system. We can't do that. Uh, so all kinds of weird things can go on there. Obviously, we made it work. Uh, but um, at any rate, shields, how and where to connect those things, that can get pretty what, crazy. Um, all kinds of other topics. Let me take a really quick pause here, see if there are any other questions or any other, uh, any other things anybody wants, to, uh, uh, wants me to go into at this point, or um, anything I've else going on? I've on my side. A, I, I pulled up the chat window. I don't know if, can you folks see the chat window? Remember, whatever you're seeing you're, on your screen is, is strictly yours, so we okay. can't see what you're seeing. Um, but I'm not seeing anything through my chat or through my Q&A. So if you don't see anything new there, then you, you're good to go. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Okay. So signal integrity, um, you want to make sure that you've got the, the signal that you actually want. There's noise from other circuitry, from the environment that can get you in trouble. Then if you've got input drive issues, like, for example, we talked about that on the headphone amplifier, it, it had input drive uh, and capacitance requirements and the bandwidth. And the output drive and bandwidth, what are you driving? Are you driving headphones? <clears throat> are you just driving another cable? Are you driving a, another uh, system or in this case maybe like a, an effect pedal or are you driving uh, a snake that might be, you know, hundreds of feet long that's going to go back to the soundboard? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, all kinds of things there. Um, then there's uh, uh, how you deal with the trace separation and the trace width and weight and so forth, um, <clears throat> the capacitance that can um, they can build up with um, traces that are right next to each other running across the board. Sometimes that can get you in trouble. So, um, excuse me. So there's um, there's a lot to deal with there, um, and then of course noise. Um, we talked about the noise calculations. Uh, information is usually in the data sheet, um, not always, but it's usually in there, and you might need to take a look at that and see what's going on. Um, obviously, 50, 50, 60 hertz noise can get into your system based on the, the power supply or the grounding, um, or 
uh, just other uh, uh, other things that are nearby. A lot of times musicians have troubles with stage lighting, especially old school stage lighting that were on these giant uh, variacs. And those things got really, really noisy and pushed a lot of stuff in there. Where you hear these, uh, the variacs, uh, as the pulse width modulation is changing, you can hear all kinds of weird uh, buzzing and changing and so forth. Um, so a couple other topics that you might need to worry about in, a, in an audio design is like the gain bandwidth and why is that important? If you look at an op amp's performance and you see that it has a gain bandwidth of, of uh, 100 kilohertz or you know, 500 kilohertz or something like that, that might seem like a lot, but if you actually have a, uh, if you actually do essentially a Bode plot of your, um, of your performance, um, you have to be really careful that you have plenty of, of gain uh, for your filters or whatever else for them to work. I, I like to have at least five times the gain uh, uh, over the top of the, uh, the particular response I have so things go bit stay linear. Um, so basically, just to, to, to get a little bit of clarification on that, so let's say you, you have a, an op amp set up for 10 times uh, gain, right? Sure. You want to make sure that for whatever bandwidth you have, you still have five times gain margin on that. Is that kind of the idea, or five times a bandwidth margin on that? I, so I like the. It just it just depends. Five times is kind of a relative thing. You have to kind of look at it and see. But if you want this, uh, if you want the amplifier to perform at at uh, uh, ten a gain of ten at twenty kilohertz, um, you better make sure that the gain bandwidth of that amplifier under all conditions, uh, not just the the uh, nominal performance that you see in the graph, but under all conditions that, that you still have plenty of gain at 20 kilohertz with an open loop gain of the op amp. So um, I, I'm guessing that our, our participants are, are familiar with open loop gain versus closed loop gain on op amps. Uh, if you're not or you want me to, to uh, talk about that for a minute, uh, go ahead and, and send a question out uh, over chat or whatever, but <clears throat> essentially the open loop gain of the op amp uh, shows uh, uh, how it performs over frequency. So you might have a, you know, a DC or zero hertz, you might have a, an open loop gain of, of 100 decibels, which is great. Um, but by the time you get all the way out to say 20 or 30 or 40 kilohertz, um, that gain might be uh, significantly less than that. It might be you know, 40 dB or, or uh, 30 dB at that point. And if it's 30 dB, but you're expecting to get a 15 dB gain, you don't have a whole lot of extra gain for that op amp to work in at that point. So you might need to pick a different part for that. And also um, the stability of the part too. Sometimes um, certain op amps require a certain amount of, uh, um, um, sorry, losing track of my thought here. There's another question here, great. Um, let's do that one actually. Um, Doug's asking about traditional lap amps like split power supplies. Do I use plus or minus or single supply? Depends on the situation. I really like split rails though because with ground in the middle like that, that's great. But you know, the way the way single rail or single supply op amps work is you have to build a an artificial ground so that the um, so the signal can swing. And I am talking about audio signals here. I'm not talking about um, other controls or whatever else. Um, but I've built a couple of different uh, variants on uh, using single rail supplies to generate split rail uh, supplies for op amps, and that works out really well as also. Um, but uh, the, the power supply impedance is, uh, is important, um, partly because uh, as the uh, amplifier or whatever it is that you're driving is requiring more and more current, you'll get more and more sag on the power supply. So if you build a, uh, if you build a, a system, you need to make sure that you either have adequate uh, reserve and bypass capacitors to manage transients, or that the power supply itself has low enough impedance uh, to drive the, the, um, the system. One way to measure that, and maybe Doug has been through that because that was Doug's question as well. Uh, one way to measure that is to put a, a small resistor in series with a power supply and then use a sensitive voltmeter to measure the drop across that resistor to see if, um, if they're essentially measuring the current um, that's coming out of the power supply, then see what kind of drop that you actually have there. Um, 
sometimes it's tough to measure with an oscilloscope, but, but it is important. That reminds me, I put a picture in here. I, don't, I must have not put it in the right directory, but I have a picture of a of a output of one of my old HP scopes that actually writes to a floppy disk. Uh, you can afford those on eBay. They're great uh, oscilloscopes, but if you don't have one in your lab, um, you ought to look on eBay and spend a couple hundred dollars and buy yourself a, a nice old oscilloscope. They used to cost, you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars back in the day, and you can buy a nice refurb one for just a couple hundred dollars now, and uh, boy, it makes a huge difference. What about speeding scope. the floppy drive? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the tough part. Uh, I need to upgrade uh, at some point to one that has a USB port on it, but um, it's not quite in my future yet. One of the uh, other topics on my design sheet or design checklist is stability, and that's making sure that you can uh, you can manage especially the capacitive loads. Um, those things, the capacitive loads tend to send a lot of op amps into uh, into fits. Um, you've got to be really careful about that, and you can isolate your um, uh, you can isolate your uh, output with just a little bit of resistance. A lot of times, and I'll take care of it. Um, oh, I guess another question here from Doug. I, actually, I use digitizing scopes. Um, I don't even have an analog oscilloscope anymore. He was asking if I was if I meant analog scope instead of a newer digital one, and by a newer digital one, I mean one that was made in the like the early 90s. Uh, some of those uh, HP scopes are just amazing, really really high bandwidth. You can get a giga sample per second oscilloscope, two channel or even a four channel, um, that will uh, do all kinds of crazy stuff, deep memory and all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, highly recommended. Great great design tool. Um, I guess the last couple of things on the list here are, you know, making sure that you are managing your distortions and nonlinearities and all that other kind of stuff that kind of comes into play and if that's going to be acceptable. And uh, then compliance. So if you're doing DIY stuff, um, you probably aren't worried, too worried about getting a CE mark on your design, but that's a whole other topic of how do, you, how do you manage getting a CE mark on your product. Um, there's a lot of testing and, and – uh, Certification that can go into that, um, safety testing and ground bonds, and making sure that the that the uh, that your ground integrity is good and people aren't going to get shocked on it. Uh, making sure that um, that the emissions and susceptibility of the device are are uh, uh, are acceptable and so forth. That's kind of a big deal, and I don't know if if that's a uh, typical consideration for uh, for this crowd. Um, but if you're going to sell your product. Um, you might want to think hard about a CE mark. At least, right? now, Because you could also go for UL and, and the other ones that are also common here in the States. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'd say CE, but that's – it could be – you're exactly right. It could be just UL. depends on, on what, you're, uh, what you're going for. But this is one of my favorites. Read the data sheet. Um, there's a surprising amount of information in data sheets. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, and uh, there are also a lot of good design tips in those as well. I don't know if the people have gone trolling around looking for um, example circuits and so forth, but that's a that's a wonderful place to go. Um, I think is there anything else here? This uh, looking back here at this design. Um, so let's let's talk a few things about now that we're, we brought up the picture, kind of how we might go about doing this in Eagle. Oh, great. Uh, you know, as far as the plane, definitely the consideration that you had to leave the uh, – to not have the plane under the input pins. Um, again, it goes back to the analog discussion of current feedback amplifiers. Even though they look similar and, and schematically they look almost – they look identical, um, they don't behave the same as maybe the voltage feedback amplifiers that most people dealt with in, in university or in school. Um, there are some subtle issues that you have to be be aware of, and and the capacitance in the feedback loop is is a big one. You know, whereas with a normal voltage feedback amplifier, capacitance is usually actually encouraged to roll off the gain. Um, as as you noted, and as TI puts in big bold letters, you know, in in their data sheet, don't put a cap in in the feedback uh, path of of the current feedback amplifier. Um, and here with the planes in Eagle, the way we would usually handle that is with version 6 moving forward, 
you can create what's known as a cutout polygon or a reverse polygon. And that would allow you to achieve the same effect. Basically, you have the large polygon, which fills the whole area. And then in these very specific areas where you're trying to avoid the parasitic capacitance, you just add in a cutout polygon to make sure that area doesn't fill, um, which is similar to what was done here. In the case of, of the chip, of the of the TPA, I think it was 6102 or 61502. I don't remember off the top of my head. Now. 6120, I think. Where did I get the 502? Oh, because that's the one I used for one of my oh. shields. Oh, that's why. <laughs> All right, the 6120. So going back to the to that, um, in the case of, of of this part, the way we would handle that in Eagle is you have you can obviously make the thermal pad under the, the the under the part. I don't know in your case if you had to actually draw this on the board or if you were able to make it as part of the library part. Um, but with an Eagle, you would be able to put in the the thermal pad as well as put in the stitching vias. So if this is a part that you use frequently. Or, like in this case, what you ended up doing is it looks like you didn't stitch all the way through. Right. Does, does, this, does this polygon actually reach from top to bottom, or there's a gap in the middle where there's no vias? Is there a gap there? Um, I can't quite tell from I, the picture. I believe that there's a gap. Um, I'd, I'd have to – I can't remember that board, if we did it there or not, but I believe there is a gap, and it might have been, uh, might have been for grounding. Okay. So, so if there if there did need to gap, be a gap, let's say if you weren't sure that you always wanted to stitch it the whole way through, then you could at least just leave it at the thermal pad, and that would be enough. But if you know you're always going to stitch them the same way, you can have the stitching vias within the library part, and that'll save you that layout in the future. Because calculating these is kind of a nuisance. You know, locate every single time, that would become very very tiring. Um, although we do have ways to, to automate, you know, putting in the stitching vias as well. So, so that that's the option for for this particular part. Um, also, noticing within the traces, I don't know if if these little are, if there's vias within the traces themselves. Is that what's going on here? Because I see little little dark spots in the traces, but it's hard to tell what they are. Yeah, those are actually vias we just stitched right through. It was the smallest available via for our board manufacturer. Oh. Okay, so with an eagle, the way you would handle that is basically as you're routing, if you hold down shift and you left click, you'll drop a V at that point and you can continue routing. So basically at every vertex, if you just hold shift and left click, it'll automatically drop a V there and you can continue routing. Um, and, and, I, and I'm sure you did that also for, for heat considerations to draw heat away? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, Doug actually put up a, a question in the chat. Um, is there any particular consideration for working in the low frequency range of audio? I mean, this is kind of bread and butter for you, Dave. Uh, he's he's referring specifically to one in ten hertz. Right. Sounds like he might be a synthesizer guy. Uh, a lot of modulation goes on down there. So, um, you know, modulating a filter, modulating an oscillator, modulating um, you know various kinds of things. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, big capacitors, right? Um, the nice thing about that is uh, if it's a sine wave, uh, it just stays out of the way of everything else typically. Um, if it's a square wave, then you've got, uh, you've got edges and so forth to deal with, um, which can get up into your audio, and, um, and that can be a problem. Um, but, no, just the same, uh, same sort of approach here. You treat things cleanly and, and so forth, um, those kinds of – Frequencies, a lot of times I would consider using a precision op amp, something that has a relatively low bandwidth. Um, back in the day, I'd use like an Oppo 7. That's a really old part by now. Um, but something that's that's got really low offset and does not have a lot of, of bandwidth, um, that way it, you're not ever going to have to worry about it uh, oscillating or going crazy. Um, and um, I, I really like the precision stuff. You, that way you can uh, – uh, you don't have to worry about AC coupling between stages and so forth. Now, you have to AC couple a one hertz signal. You need a really big capacitor. So um, that would be a, one thing I would look at. I don't yeah, know if that answers your question, Doug. Yeah, some, 
usually I think the the precision op amps like those sometimes are called choppers, even though the term is kind of a misnomer nowadays because there's a lot of different architectures for achieving that that is not a chopper architecture, but they, they kind of stuck with that name where they have a very small bandwidth, but they have high DC accuracy and, and very, very low offset. Right. So that's, I think that's kind of what you're referring to there. Right. Um, and some of these precision op amps, as you say, have extremely high gain. And so uh, it just makes your signal so clean and nice uh, to not have to worry about ever getting in the way of the, the gain bandwidth product of the amplifier. Um, but yeah, I would I would just definitely check and make sure you're using the, or make sure you need it first, but I would use a uh, one of the op amps with a tiny offset. I mean, one with a handful of microvolts is really not unusual. Um, that's a great way to go. Um, we have a, we do have another question, but before we go into it, I just want to point out um, just one of the the classical tenets of of layout, and we can see it here with the way you've laid out your resistors. I'm looking specifically at the left side, R64, R84, R66. You guys notice that all those components are really as close as you can get them to the part, um, and that's just a general good rule of thumb. The shorter you can keep connections, the better off you are. Um, you, you're minimizing your parasitics, parasitic resistances, inductances, um, any stray antennas, any unintentional antennas are minimized by keeping traces short. So that's just a, a really good general rule of thumb and, and it's a real good example we're seeing here in, in Dave's layout of just keeping components as close and as tight as you can to the main integrated circuit they're going to be working with. And, and obviously the way TI designed this part helps in that because basically the left side is the left channel and the right side is the right channel. Not all manufacturers do a good job thinking about how this part's going to be connected in a real live circuit. So kudos to them and, and kudos to you for, for doing that as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly it. Why one of those parts just as close as they could physically be especially anything that's a feedback around that part, which is probably uh, just kind of eyeballing. It's probably R66 and R65, I would guess, are the, the feedback resistors. And a, an, an added benefit from that, it's easier to probe it. <laughs> when you're troubleshooting and bringing the board up, you don't have to worry about getting your probe across a whole bunch of pins on the chip if you've got a, a, a component nearby that, um, that has a, that's, that's standing up. Um, probably like a lot of people, I grew up on through-hole parts, and... Uh, you know, as, as I get older and my, my eyesight's not quite as good as it used to be, and I'm not that old, but, it, but these parts keep getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> so hard to see. Yeah, we have, a, we have a question from Igor, and Igor, I may ask you clarification on it, but his question is, there was a note on digital and analog grounds. So what is the recommendation on designing it in a preamp? Oh, great, okay. Well, um, I would try to keep the digital and the analog as far from each other as you physically can. And then um, the, I guess under the ideal situation, I'd have a ground plane under my analog that would be, um, that would be strictly shield, and I have a ground plane under my digital that would be, uh, that could be return and shield, but I would just try to connect them at one point, um, probably pretty close to where the main system ground is, so that I keep those things as far away from each other electrically and physically as possible. Um, that's that's more or less the ideal way to do it. If you can't get that that separation for whatever reason, um, then a lot of times what I've found is uh, I can uh, I can be really careful with my bypass capacitors and and uh, maybe even um, if, if the analog and digital grounds don't have to be exactly at the same potential, sometimes I'll connect them through a little resistor like a couple ohm resistor or even heaven forbid an inductor. Sometimes an inductor actually makes sense to connect those kinds of things together um, because you've got the DC connection, but then anytime there's high frequency, the inductor resists the higher frequency, so you can kind of keep some of the noise out of the analog that might be present on the digital plane. Uh, that would be a last resort. Um, there's an awful lot of really good information out there. Uh, probably one of the best books that I've seen um, is called High Speed Digital Systems by uh, the guy's name is actually Howard Johnson, like the hotel chain, and uh, Howard is one of the one of the best guys at EMC that I've run into from from uh, handling the really high frequency crazy stuff that goes on. Yeah, Igor, does that answer your your question? Let me let us know if 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 you want us to follow up on that. 
Um, continuing with, with your suggestion, Dave, um, you know, having them connect back at a single point, um, there's an app note by one of the analog devices. I, I'm sure he's retired by now. Um, but usually they define that system ground being close to the power supply. Yes. You know, so have have the, the analog and the digital meet at one point and have it usually go back to, to the power supply since that's where, where all of your currents and everything returns to eventually. You know, putting having them connect at that point, you avoid interacting between the two, interaction between the two planes. That's the best way to do it if you can. Yeah. Igor says yes, so that that's good. Cool. Okay. Anything else you wanted to cover, Dave, or if there's any other questions in general, both Eagle or analog related, feel free to send them our way, guys. Yeah, I'll wait to see if there are any other questions. Um, okay. Amazing to think we've been talking for an hour. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing anything on, on my end. Are you getting anything on your end, Dave? Uh, no, I don't see anything. Okay. Well, I think we can we can end this one here unless there's something else you want to add, David. No, I just want to say thank you, George, to you and to uh, uh, Element 14 and Eagle and so forth. This has been a lot of fun, and, and I really appreciate you folks asking me to to participate in this, and uh, uh, I hope that the folks that were on got something out of it. I sure enjoyed the questions and enjoyed talking through all this stuff. So thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, David. All right. Thank you. Thank you.